So good. So welcome to our finance mastery workshop. And um, for those, I think everyone's been to work these workshops before. Um, Olivia, have you done any others? No, your I haven't. First? Your, fir your first one is the finance one. Wow. So you're in for a treat then. This is uh, this is the best one. All the other sales, marketing, it's, that's all. That's all the easy stuff. This is where it really, really counts. So, so we, the six in the series, um, and we rotate these every three months. And um, so I think uh, the next one, which will be actually next week. So I had to bring it forward because uh, and it's on a Wednesday. So if you do want to come to that one, it will be next Wednesday at four o'clock, uh, which will be the sales mastery that we'll be covering um, that one. So, so finance. The, the key, as, as you'll see from all of my workshops, is we come back to this uh, be, do, have. You know, who do I need to be? What do I want to do? What do I want to have? What are my dreams and my goals? What's my attitude, knowledge, and skills? And you know, what do I actually need to do? So the, these are the, sort of the fundamentals uh, within this to, to really understand what we're actually trying to achieve. Uh, within our businesses, within our own personal goals, etc. So if we, if we look at this and say, right, what's, what is it that you would like to get out of this, this sort of workshop today? You know, what, what are the key things that I can help you with? Uh, if there is a chat box there, uh, if you want to sort of type anything in the chat box, that'd be good. But we're, we're, we're a small, small team today, so uh, you can just sort of, unmute yourself if you want to and uh, and just and I'll, I'll make a note of them as we go so, so olivia let's just i'll start with you what's what, what would you like to get out of today with regard to finance so nick well we both that's not fair to say nick has the idea but we both thought that uh, it'd be good to take if i took more of a financial role within the business if he's going to take more of a sales role and we filled more of a project management role and so i've been trying to do a bit more at our end of the month meetings but i struggle to talk about things i don't fully understand okay so if nick generates our like end of month he'll talk me through it but i really struggle to like i like I did sciences degree, so I really like to know exactly from grassroots what everything is, rather than just having a result and being able to talk about it. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so for you, a, a, an overview of the finance side would be would be good to get a feel. Yes. We probably don't can't go down into real detail today, but it's de definitely going to be at that higher level. So, cool, good, Megan. Um, yeah, again, probably just a bit of an overview. Um, obviously, there's other aspects of business that I've tried to learn myself that I generally find more interesting. And I think finance is probably one that I've avoided. <laughs> that sounds difficult. You're not um, the only one, Megan. It's the one that most people avoid. No, just the accountant does that. But uh, as, yeah, as you'll so see, it's one of the most important. So face it head on. Uh, cool. OK, good. Jan? Um, so from my point of view, what I would like to get out of it is to almost have it second nature whereby I understand like margins and markups and how it all affects the bottom line. Um, accounts, it doesn't come naturally to me. I'm, I'm much more of a creative person. I like speaking, mm -hmm. thinking outside the box like that. And I really have to engage my brain when people say margin and markup and things, you know, and I can do it, but I want it to feel more fluid. I want yeah. it to, to feel like it comes naturally to me where it's just because it should do from a business point of view. And I'm yeah. aware that everything has such a knock on effect to the bottom line, but I just want it to feel more fluid. Yeah. Cool. Good, good. Uh, Dave? Um, yeah, maybe have a little look at drilling down the profit and loss, Kevin. Um, as usual, we make money every month, everyone gets paid every month, but there's never a lot left in the bank. Right. The more we make, the more we spend. Yeah. So so what, what's the question you need to ask then? Well, we know that to increase our turnover, we increase our overheads, whether it's just subcontractors or whatever we do. 
it's just knowing a bit more of when I look at my profit and, loss, profit and loss accounts to find out more of, well, basically how to read the thing. Yeah. Okay. So, so it's that differential of uh, gross, yeah, it's the gross profit and the net profit, I think, is, is, is the key well, part. I've just, I've just opened mine next to me now, Kevin, on zero. And basically, yep. it's got your sales income. Yeah, I'm happy with that. My gross profit. Yeah, I'm happy with that. My operating expenses. Yeah, they could be trimmed. And then you've got your net profit at the bottom. And then you go, well, if that's my net profit for the month, where is it? Why is it not on the bank? Okay. Yeah. Excellent. I'll definitely show you that one. <laughs> Are you going to find like 50 grand somewhere, Kevin? I don't know where it is. I will. I'll, I'll show you where to look for it, Dave. So I can't say I will find it, but I will show you where you where you need to be looking. Um, and this this is key for everybody that once you understand what the the financial statements do, then you start looking in the right place. A lot of us are not looking for the right things in the right place, which is why we don't find them. Which is why we just go, ah, oh, can't be bothered and forget about it and move on. So, um, so this is good. Okay, cool. So, so if we think about the, again, the be, do, have, one of the key things is being clear what we want to have. Now, we've got to understand that the game of business is all about making profit. Okay, so profit is the fundamental within it. It's the real indication of whether we're doing well or we're not doing well. Um, I was quite shocked the other day. Did, have you heard about Kazoo? The online car company you, you see the adverts on tv where um they're sort of buying cars online and so this company turns over 162 million pounds in turnover okay and it's only been going i think two years about two years it's doing 162 million in turnover so you think yeah this is a really good it's advertising on tv etc yet that uh, it lost 88 million last year and you start to think, OK, so it's not quite doing as well as you think it is. But and this is why sometimes you've got you while we focus on the profit, you've got to understand your business model, where you're going to go with it, how you actually get there. And because sometimes you you can make a loss for a few years. Yeah. But with a view that it's, it's leading you somewhere. So if you look like the, the likes of Uber. Yeah, all of these big companies that now are being sold for multi millions, if not billions of pounds, many of them have not made any money. Okay, but the game they're playing is, is a, has a different scoring system than the games that you and I are playing. Okay, so for us, for, for mere mortal businesses, if we don't make profit, we won't be in business in a year, two years' time. And the more business that we make, the happier our shareholders are, the more we can reinvest back in the business and the safer we are so that when situations like COVID come along, we've got resources behind us to actually survive the down, downturns. So it's a little bit like, um, yeah, imagine you were a farmer and you're you know, growing your crops. You wouldn't grow your crops and then eat all your crops in the summer and the autumn you'd need to put summer by to get you through the winter. And that's really what understanding your numbers is, is, well, how much do I need? How much do I need to keep? How much can I take out? You know, what is there to reinvest, et cetera. Okay. So, so the first thing we need to look at within, within the business is the, is our beliefs. So what are our beliefs around money? Okay. So, our, our beliefs are really is, is about the mindset because many of us, if, if our mindset is wrong, then we start ignoring things or we miss things. Uh, we, we perceive them in slightly different ways. OK, so, so if we look at money, that our beliefs around money is money can be a far more emotional thing than we think that it actually is. OK, so and those emotions affect our decisions. So what I want you to think about is what what are some of the sort of negative beliefs you have around money at the moment? So you know, when I when I sort of say money to you, what would be some of the negative beliefs you have? 
Not having enough. Not have enough. Yep. So, so I think in my my opinion, for me, from a business point of view, it I've got the money there, but I'm, I'm like frightened to spend it. I'm I'm frightened to invest it in case something bad happens. Um, so I feel like I'm always erring on the side of caution rather than maybe taking calculated risks. Yep. So money is a bit of a comfort blanket. If I've got it, then I'm it's, comfortable. It's a, it's a if it goes, net. I'm in. I'm in trouble. Yep. It's a net, yeah. Yep. Very good. That's, that's, that is a very common one. So our, our fear of loss is greater than our fit, our joy of gaining. So, what other what other negative beliefs can we have around money? I think. Well, I don't think I struggle with when we've. I need to phone somebody to remind them that they owe us an invoice. And I almost feel guilty for phoning them, despite the fact that we did the work. Yep. It's our money, but yep. I'm, I struggle to start that conversation without worrying that they're going to get cross at me, but they asked us to do the work. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so chasing it feels, Oh God, you know, I'm going to upset somebody if I chase them for money. But, um, Good. Megan, what about what about you? How does... um, I think something different. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure it's a belief, but I've, in my experience, like some customers can get quite emotional over over money um, yep. so it's definitely um, so, so, so mo money has this ability to make us feel in different ways okay and, and the, first, the first thing we've got to understand is we've got to be clear what our emotions are around it you know the fear of loss you know there's, there's the old saying is you know, money's the root of all evil you know being rich you know you know, rich people sort of uh, are bad people, you know, poor people are bad people, you know, we always associate something, you know, money with that particular thing that we're talking about. So, but what we've got to sort of look at is to say, look, numbers themselves, when we're looking at a business, numbers are actually quite a logical thing. They are just a reflection of some actions that happened in the past. Okay, you did this, you did some sales, yeah, you bought some stuff, and then the numbers are the actual end result. So, so we've got this sort of balance in our brains that are going on. We've got the logical side of, well, they're just numbers. You know, they don't mean anything. Okay, but then we've got the emotion side is, is the picture that we paint around them. So if I have lots of money, I'll create a picture around having lots of money. If I have no money, I create a picture of having no money. And those pictures, can, a lot of it can be based on our upbringing, you know, our experiences to date, all sorts of stuff that happens that gives us this emotion that comes out. And, and that emotion creates this cycle. OK, so we, we think something, we feel it, we create a behavior and the behavior reinforces our thought. So, so often when it comes to sort of money within business is our past experiences will influence our future behaviors. So if we've come from a, um, you know, a background where money's been scarce and we haven't had enough money and we've been without money, what sort of negative behaviors can that actually lead to? Jan, that might be one that with, with your sort of feelings of, you know, holding on to money might resonate with you. So, so I think I think that's exactly. I, I would never have known that until right now. Um, but you know, tough childhood. Um, didn't have a lot. Um, bit of a bit of a shit of a stepdad who was like, oh well, you know, you're never going to amount to anything. And I think that's kind of propelled me to prove that I can be successful um, in various different aspects of my life. But why I also feel like I've got to kind of save money in case worst case scenario happens, which was drilled into me from an early age, I guess. Yep. Yeah. 
So, so you can start to see that that those patterns. Yeah, you know, if you if you go back, your your attitude to money, your beliefs around money will have they have to come from past experiences. So if I so I flip that now and say, let's say we came from a really affluent family that had loads of money. Okay, what would be some behaviours that some negative behaviours that we could sort of start to identify with that? Well, I guess you, you could flip it and just think, oh, well, it's always going to be there. We'll take, you know, high risks, yep. spend, 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 not realising that actually we'll have to be sensible with our money because one day it might not be there. Yeah. Yeah, money has little meaning to me. It's not, I don't really, I don't value it to hold on to it. It's just about spending it. Okay, so it, it can create the opposite sort of behaviours of being a bit reckless, you know, blasé about it. So, uh, but both, you know, if you think about it, both could actually create good behaviours as well. So if, you know, if, if there's a scarcity, it means it's precious, I'll hang on to it. I'll, I'm very careful what I invest in. I want to make sure that it, it's invested correctly. The good behaviours of having lots of money means I'm I'm not scared of spending it. I will I will look for opportunities. So so the first question we've got to sort of go back is is ask ourselves what is our relationship with money? What does it mean to us? Okay, because those can actually influence us as we start looking at at numbers um, as we go forward. So in in a way, my you know, if I, if I go back through my sort of journey, you know, my, but my parents had businesses. So I was very aware of numbers from probably the age of 11. You know, my dad was doing his accounts. You know, he would sort of show me how they all worked. So I, I got to sort of, in a way, love numbers or P&L accounts before I even really knew what they were. You know, it's, I had that sort of understanding of what went into them. I then got involved with, companies that were going through massive growth so you know they they were turning over multi millions of pounds you know our payroll was hundreds of thousands of pounds so i had this sort of disconnect with the, the money we were spending out on wages etc had no relation to, to, to me because you know i was being i was probably being paid 40 50 000 pounds a year and i was spending 400 000 pounds a month in wages so there's no connection there with the numbers that are going on in the business and my own value. If I was, if it was closer to what I was taking, I'd probably have more of a relationship with it, okay, a more more affinity, and therefore it could mean that oh, I won't pay that because you know that's far more than I get paid. And the the key to all of this is the the money side of things is we as as we building businesses. We've got to be very careful that we don't have this fear. These, you know, if they're good behaviours, then great. Keep them going, replicate them, do more of it. But if you've got something that you, you look at and you start to feel that actually this behaviour might be holding me back, so Jan might be, you know, I'm not, I'm not spending it, I'm not investing it, I'm holding it onto it, then... We've got to start thinking, well, what is that false expectation that is starting to appear real? And question it. That's all we're asking. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying question it. Is it helping me or is it hindering? If it's hindering, then we might need to work on that belief. If it's helping, great, do more of it. So we've got to start seeing, certainly with, with numbers within our business, is Numbers are just a reflection of what's happened. Okay, they, there, is, there should almost be no emotion to those numbers. Because they're not reality. They're not the here and now. They're, they are just a, uh, a summary of past behaviours up to this day. So if we made a loss last month, I'm not saying don't, we, we look at it blase, you know, blase, we look at it and go, actually, is, is making a loss a good thing or a bad thing? It's probably a bad thing, but not get emotional about it. Go, oh, no, you know, what's going to happen? If I carry on making a loss, my business is going to go out of business. You know, I'm not going to get that money in. And, and that emotion will start to drive your behaviours. And that's what we want to get away from. Emotions are good to have, 
but not to drive and be in control of, of your behaviors. Because the, the, the number one behavior I, I see the most, so if, if I look at my numbers and they're, and they're bad numbers, they're, they're not good numbers, and I have a bad feeling about it, what's the first thing I, I generally do or I start to do? Dave, if, if something, something was to you that you saw on a regular basis that you didn't like, what would, what would you be inclined to start doing? Start panic and change everything. Panic and change everything, yeah, okay. Now, what, what if you changing things was difficult? Or you didn't know what to change? You'd start worrying about sort of trying to shut down and keep what you've got, cut your losses. Yeah, I suppose I'm, I'm thinking a little bit perhaps before that. So, so you look at your numbers, they're not good. Next month, you look at your numbers, they're not good. You, you're surviving, you're doing, you, but they don't, they're not feeling you with a positive emotion. What would, you, what would you tend to do, start or potentially start to do that could be very dangerous? Carry on with the negative thoughts. Yeah. What would be more dangerous than that? Borrow. Borrow? What would be more dangerous than that? Mm. If I if I look in the mirror and I don't like what I see, yeah, what will I generally do? Stop looking in the mirror. Stop looking in the mirror. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what, what do people generally do if they look at their numbers and they don't like what they see? Stop looking at them. Stop looking at the numbers. Okay, because because the pain when I look at it is is there, it's here and now. The pain, you can only feel pain in the present, okay? It's not, you can't feel pain in the future, you can't feel pain in the past. It's, it's literally in the present. So when I look at numbers and I look at them and go, oh, I don't like those, you're, you're naturally built to move away from pain. And the quickest way to move the pain is, actually, I won't look at them. If I don't look at my numbers, I can't feel pain. And that is far more dangerous than actually looking at it and, and doing all those things that you said, you know, being impelled to actually move on and, uh, and, and take control and do things like that. Even if you do the wrong thing, yeah, even the wrong thing is better than doing nothing or ignoring it. Yeah, you try to do something about it rather than just leaving it. Exactly. Okay, so, so what we want to try and do is get away from the emotion, the, the feeling of when I look at numbers, it's a, you know, I feel really excited or really upset. It's, it's you look at the numbers and you go, right, yeah, the only thing that matters is what am I actually going to do as a result of those numbers? There's no emotion. It's just, right, they show a loss, they show a profit. What am I going to do? If I make a profit, great. What am I going to do? What am I going to invest that profit in? If I make a loss, great. What am I going to do to actually ensure it's a profit next month? So, so the, one of the first things I want you to do is start noticing when you look at numbers now, how do you feel? If they excite you and you want to look at them more, great. I think that's a positive behavior. If there's a negative behavior with it, then question it and say, well, why am I feeling this? And ultimately, when you get as long in the tooth to look at numbers at, with me, you just, yeah, they're just numbers. It's just, it really, you know, it's really more of a case of what I do with them that matters rather than what they actually say. Any, any questions about that side of things? Does that, does that resonate? I know, I know you know, Megan and Olivia, this is probably, you're, you're sort of pretty new to this, so you may not have got these feelings, but um, does, the, does that sort of make sense to you? It's like a little bit, uh, I presume you, you know, you've got bank statements, you look at your bank, your personal bank statements. How, how often do you look at your personal bank statement, Megan? Uh, quite often. Quite uh, often, okay. Is, is it, do you feel good when you look at it or do you feel bad when you look at it? <laughs> bad. Bad, okay. 
it's, it's the same thing with your personal bank statements. If you look at it and go, oh, that's bad, that will in, you'll be inclined then not to look at it, ignore it. Yeah, no, I, I was feeling bad up until the beginning of this year and I did actually decide now I'm going to do something about this and just get more organised really. Fabulous. That's good. That's, that's, that is all that we're looking here, you know, is, yeah, if you don't like it, great, do something about it. Yeah, if you look in the mirror and you don't like what you see, fantastic, do something about it. Yeah, ignoring it is is the worst thing that you can do with this. Just yeah, and that but unfortunately with finance and accounts, that's what most people do. And it gets to a point where you don't open the, the invoices, you don't look at the bills, you know. And and uh, uh, Olivia, you were you were chasing debts, weren't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so what you've got to do is you've got to put yourself into your customer's shoes. Yeah. They've got all these negative beliefs going around as well. So yeah. if they're in a bit of a bad way and they don't want to look at their numbers, they're not going to open your invoices. They're not going to post your invoices. They're not going to pay your invoices. Okay. So you just got to accept that that's how they're feeling and actually just make sure that the pain of not paying your invoices is greater than the, pay, the pain of paying. <laughs> Which is lots of letters. <laughs> don't, you don't want me phoning you up every single day asking you when I'm going to get paid, do you? So, okay. So, so when we when we look at this, then we've got to start saying, okay, what gets measured gets improved. In any anything in life. So, do you remember when you were a kid, growing up? Yeah, and did your parents get you by the? The door and mark your height as you grew up is that is that still done i don't know i mean uh, do you do that with your kids jan yeah so so what as, as a child when you're doing that what what does that entice in, incentivize you to do as a kid well part of it was like you know Eat your veggies, you know, you're going to grow big and strong because, like, Megan was a right little bugger for eating, you know. And yep. then it got to a point, she's still doing it now because she's, she's 16, she stopped growing about two years ago and she's gone from being one of the tallest to the shortest. And she's still on the back of the dining room door, will stand there and say, Have I grown? Oh my God, I haven't stopped growing yet, you know. And it's just, it's the habit. Yep. You know, it, it, it's getting into a good habit if then you just you monitor that, that measurement if it happens all the time. Exactly. And, th and that's that's the feeling that we sort of want to get when we look at numbers. And a number in isolation means nothing. A number compared to something else starts to bring meaning. So my height, you know, this month compared to last month, yeah, means something. My weight this month to last month means something. My weight in isolation means nothing. So what, what we're all inherently programmed for that makes us feel good is progress. Am I making progress? Am I moving forwards? See, when, when we make progress, when we do things like that, our brains give off a, a chemical called dopamine. Okay, and dopamine is our happy drug. Okay, so it makes us feel happy. So when the child is measuring, they've, they've grown, oh, I feel great, yeah, that's great. I feel more motivated to do things. So all we're looking for in our numbers is, I want to see some progress. Yeah, if I can see progress, then I feel good. Yeah, and, and yeah, as, as human beings, we all want to feel good. Okay, so, so while I say remove the emotion, we want the good emotions, what we don't want is a bad emotions or react from those. So your numbers are just like the scorecard. So your profit and loss, all the numbers we look in a business is just a scorecard. So if you play games, now I'm, I, I love golf. Okay? I'm, I'm sort of addicted to golf. And so for me, when I go out and play golf, actually recording my score, you know, I don't have to have somebody looking over my shoulder to say, oh, Kevin, you've got to score. You know, you've got to keep your score. At the end of the round, if I have a bad score, I don't throw my toys out of the plant, pram and give up golf. Yeah, I do sometimes, <laughs> but, but even when I, I've had the worst round ever, you know, having a bad score 
yeah, when, Dave, when you have a bad score, what does what does that motivate you to do? <laughs> Stay in the clubhouse longer afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> no, it does. It motivates you to go to the driving range, get a bit more practice in. Yeah. So, so, so if you think about in sport, a bad result motivates you to do better. Mm-hmm. What does a good result motivate you to do? Keep trying to keep on the same level. Come back and and you know, ride the wave. Yeah. So, what is it within business? Is we see a bad result for a month. And we feel bad, oh, I can't be bothered. Yeah. Whereas in sport, when we're playing the game, even a bad result can motivate us to do something. Now, if you were to go out and score badly every single time at any sport after a period of time, that you're more likely to give up. But what you're looking for is, is some progress. Have I made some progress? Has that practice actually helped me to move forward? And at the essence of the numbers and finance within a business, that is all we're looking for. Okay, is is if I can find some area in which I'm progressing, some number that shows I'm doing well, yeah, then that's going to motivate me to do more and carry on. But this doesn't mean that you cheat, because I I could get to the end, you know, play play around a golf, and I could put down, you know, birdie, 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 all the way across. 18 under par. Yeah, when I've I've come nowhere near that. But who who in golf actually does that? I know people cheat a little bit, but nobody cheats to that level. You just you wouldn't play the game if you felt compelled to cheat. So you've got to understand that most people in business, when we're doing this for ourselves, but our team members, if you really understand what the game is and how how it's scored, 99.9% of people won't cheat. Because at the end of the day, I'm just cheating myself. Okay, and you know, if you do cheat one month, it will always come back and bite you the next month. Okay, so we start thinking that you know, the numbers within our business, our beliefs around numbers are about where we're trying to get to. You know, what, what is the goal that we're trying to aim to and it should be there to motivate us. We want to see our numbers because I want to see my progress. I want to see how well I've done. And this is where I'll come back to later on is sometimes our monthly key performance indicators, in other words, our profit and loss account, is too far in the too far in the future to motivate us. So therefore, our num- some of our numbers should be on a far more regular basis than once a month. If I played, uh, um, Olivia, do you play any sport? Uh, I ride horses. You ride horses. Excellent. So uh, what do you do? Dressage or? Uh, just getting jumping? back into it. But yes, I do. Like, do dress- on the ground, not not flying in the yeah, air is always good. Jump, jumping horses are, <laughs> far, uh, horses are dangerous enough as it is, but jumping <laughs> horses are far more dangerous. So, so if you do a, a dressage competition and you, you do your yeah, four minutes and then you're told what your score is a month later, how do you feel about that? Well, I guess it would be irrelevant because you're not in the moment then. You can't go, well, well, I agree with that. Yes, I felt that was wrong. So I'll go back and, I don't know, work on my walking. <laughs> it's, too late, isn't it? it's like, <laughs> what, what's the point? It's, it's hard enough with dressage because you have to wait until, what, probably half an hour after you've done it, don't you? you yeah, at least. Half an hour. <laughs> where's the score? Around. Where's the score? <laughs> and uh, and then then when you do win, yeah, all you win is a bloody rosette. If that, <laughs> if, if, if you're lucky, and I think yeah. But uh, as as yeah, my wife says, you know, she says yeah, but the rosette means so much. It's just a rosette, yeah. But uh, but it's but the rosette, and this is this is the key when we come back to incentivizing performance, you know. It's not the rose. The rosette is just a marker of the performance that I've done. Okay, it's it's the performance that I'm proud of. The rosette is just marks it. So it doesn't matter that it's a rosette. It could be fifty grand. It's not the money. It's not the rosette. It's the performance that I feel that I've actually done. So, so one one sec. Okay. 
No, I'm, I'm in the middle of uh, uh, a workshop at the moment. Okay, okay cool. Cheers. Oh, okay, cheers. Um, so, so that's really what we want to start thinking is I want to look at the numbers because it's going to show my performance. It's going to show my progress. If it's a bad result, great. It should motivate me to do better. If it's a good result, great. It's a reinforcement of what, you know, of, of what I've actually achieved. So, so if we look at, you know, why our numbers are important, you know, they're, they're a score sheet of past performance. They're also a barometer of what's going on, you know, around me. They should motivate me. The other real key thing is they, they are universally understood. You know, if you're running a business in Southampton, if you're running one in Beijing, if you're running, you know, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, the profit and loss account, yeah, and the balance sheet are universally understood. Everyone understands what the numbers mean. So, so we only have to learn, in effect, one language, whereas, you know, if we go between countries, we have to learn a lot of other languages. A good comparison, they are just a reflection of past decisions, and they help us make better decisions, okay? But they're also the lifeblood of the business. Yeah, if we don't make profit, if we don't do this, then there is no business. There is, you know, we, we are going to going to crash and burn at some stage. So. so we've got to look at this and say, right, in our business, everybody has to own a particular number within, within the actual business itself. So if we look at this and say, if we draw an organization chart, who, who would be at the top of an organization chart, Dave? That'd be me. Okay, so what is your role at the top of the tree? <laughs> Everything. Um, no, so what, what's the, what would the title be at the top of the tree? Uh, managing director. Okay, so as a managing director, who do you report to? The shareholders. The shareholders, okay. So the top of the tree is a shareholder. Now... What is a shareholder interested in? What what number is a what number is a shareholder interested in? Profit. Oops. Profit. What what more specifically? As a as a shareholder, I don't get profit, do I? I don't get paid profit. How how do I get my money? What are the share value? Share value, yep. Yeah. So my shares go up in value. And what else? I only get that if I sell my shares, really. So what do I get on an annual basis out of the business? Is it not a dividend from the net profits? Yeah, a dividend. Okay, so I'm interested in a return on investment. So as a shareholder, I've invested thousand pounds in the business and i expect a return on investment which is the value of my shares and a dividend that comes out okay in order to achieve that as a shareholder who do i appoint to run run the business for me the managing director managing director okay so so the managing director is tasked with giving a return on investment to the shareholders so how does the, how do we know or what what's the goal that the managing director is therefore tasked to achieve in order to pay a dividend and get shareholder value what do they need to achieve a profit profit okay so the, the managing director owns the profit figure on the profit and loss account so the bottom figure you know after all the income expenditure that's the figure that the md owns but the MD doesn't run the company on their own. They would appoint a set of people to actually help them with this, okay? So those people are marketing director, yeah? And the marketing director would be responsible for what number? Sales. Okay, before sales comes? 
advertising. The result of advertising that we want is clients. Clients or <laughs> leads. leads. Yeah. Okay, so marketing goal is generate leads. The then we appoint the sales director. So the sales director's goal is to what? Increase the sales. By doing what? Converting the leads. the leads. Converting the leads. Okay. So between those two people, they're responsible for which number on the profit and loss account? Turnover. Sales, turnover. Okay. Then I appoint an operations director. So they're responsible for what? The actual operation, get the jobs done. Get the jobs done. So the direct costs of the business. Yeah. So between those three people, marketing, sales, and operations, they're responsible for gross profit. Mm -hmm. Then we have a finance director. So which part of the profit and loss account does the finance director look after? Direct costs again. Um, no, because you, you can't have two people responsible for the same number because you're, you're going to get com conflict. What what comes after direct costs and gross profit? Operating expenses. Operating expenses or generally called overheads. Yeah. Okay. The finance director also owns the balance sheet, and I'll come on to that later. Okay. But between all of those four, they're responsible for the net profit. Okay, and then we've got HR, and HR is responsible for making sure that the people are happy because a business that is purely focused on profit becomes a pretty miserable place. Uh, so we've got to have a balance to make sure we've got, you know, happy people that we're, we're working with. So, so if we look at this and think about your profit and loss account, each number on the, the figure is a reflection of the performance of each of those individual areas. Sales is a reflection of how sales and marketing are working. Operations is a reflection of gross profit. Those three together, is a ref, or gross profit is a reflection of those three uh, areas together. Overheads is a reflection of how finance is performing and the balance sheet is about finance as well. So when we're the owner, so so Dave, in your business, yeah, where do you sit in here? Who, who's in this box here? That's me. That's you. This box here? Me. This box here? Me. This one? Me. This one? Me. Yeah, this one? Me. And this one? And um, me and occasionally outsourcing is a horrible job. Excellent. A bit of outsourcing. Okay. So, so what happens is, you know, as the managing director, you're responsible for profit, but you're also responsible for leads, conversion, direct costs, overheads, and the happiness of the people. And that's why it's so hard when you're running a small business because, you know, what hat are you wearing? And if, if I'm sitting here, let's say I'm, I've got a big organization and I'm the managing director and I've got my marketing director and my sales director and we haven't achieved the sales this quarter, who does the marketing director blame for not achieving sales? Sales director. Sales director. And who does the sales director blame? Marketing for not enough leads. If I'm not hitting gross profit, who does the operations director blame? Sales. Sales and marketing. Mm -hmm. Who does sales and marketing blame? The operations. Operations. And if I don't hit the net profit, who does the finance director blame? Operations, marketing, and sales. These people. And who do these people blame? Mm -hmm. Are we spending too much on overhead? So, so there's tension between each of these departments. 
Okay, they're always they're in effect working against each other. So if we're not as the managing director, so the clue is in the title, manage the directors. So I've got to manage it, the relationship between these to make sure they're not pulling against each other, they're working together as a team. So there isn't blame, oh, sales is blaming marketing, marketing is blaming sales, sales and marketing blaming operations. That they're actually working together to say, look, I don't care what the result is, what are you doing next week, next month, next quarter to improve what we've got. And if, we've, if we look at that emotion, you know, people's emotions behind the numbers, if we've got you know, emotional people that look at their numbers and ignore them or worry about them in each of these roles, then we've got problems. What we want is people that look at their numbers and go, do you want their great numbers, I'm gonna do better. Yeah, or they're crap numbers and I'm going to do better. So they're always working together to move forwards. Okay, so, so we've really got to look at this and start understanding that the profit and loss account is just a reflection of the performance of each of these departments. And eventually, you know, you'll have separate people looking after each one. In a small business, unfortunately, you know, one person is generally looking after a, a lot of them, which is why it's, it can be so tiring and stressful. So we've, we've looked at saying shareholders want return on investment. Okay, they want dividend and share growth, we, and therefore we have to make profit. So the overall game of a business is to make profit. But that's the end result of all these games within games that we're playing at each different level. So when we look at the business and the profit and loss account, they are just a reflection of that. So one of the key things to understand is, you know, while we want to make dividends, dividends and shareholder value, the ultimate aim is obviously to create you know, valuation you know, or value within our business. So and to, to, to get a feel for that is how businesses are actually valued. So a business is valued, and I'll, I'll use the language in here, but it says net present value of future cash flows or a multiple of earnings of EBITDA. Now, I don't know if you've heard this term EBITDA before. So EBITDA stands for earnings before interest, tax, and depreci depreciation amortization. It's quite a long Sort of, uh, sort of set well, term earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, amortization. For, for where most people are, I would ignore that. It's basically this is really just net profit. Okay, it's a more sophisticated way to calculate this figure. But for, for most people, it's just some. You know, the, the bottom figure on the profit and loss account multiplied by a number. Okay, now this number here is what we've got to understand how that number is made up. So in addition to that, you would pay, pay the net assets, net, net asset value of the balance sheet. Okay, so what, in effect, what money has been retained within the business? plus its performance. But this figure here is generally quite small when compared to this. This is the big number. Okay, and if that's a big number, and that's a big number, then that is a very big number. Okay, so, so whenever we come to buy a business or sell a business, all we're really doing is, is buying its ability to generate future profits. So if I've got a business that is a, a two times multiple, yeah, so I'm gonna pay twice the net profit, it means I'm gonna pay two years of profits before I've recouped my money. So it's just return on investment. I, I buy a business for 100,000, it makes 50,000 pounds a year, I get my money back in two years. The longer the 
the uh, the value, the more uh, so the bigger the number. So if this is ten, I've got to wait ten years to get my money back. So that business has got to be really substantial to guarantee my money coming back over 10 years. Or it's got to be on a big growth path in the fact that this year's profit is going to be 10 times what it is next year. So I get my money back that way. So that's really all how businesses are valued. It's just its ability to generate profit and how secure that profit is in the future. So EBITDA, I'm not going to go into this in too much detail, but that's our, our normal sort of profit and loss account. And we add back interest, taxes, depreciation. So th these are all, so all of these figures here are sort of what we would call optional. Okay, so I can choose whether I borrow money and pay interest. I can choose to a certain extent how much tax I pay. I can choose my depreciation, my amortization rates. Okay, and the, these are depreciation amortization are the writing off of an asset over, over a period of time. I'll, I'll come back more to that when I look at the uh, balance sheet. Okay, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. I'd, I'd do a little bit more for, for businesses that are looking to, you know, to sell. So the average multiple, so the average multiple of businesses that are sold is around about two to three. Okay, so the average business that gets sold is, is a two or three times multiple. Great businesses get sold for multiples of five plus. Okay, so we've got to understand how what we need to do within a business to get that higher multiple. You know, how do we how do we grow value in the business? We can grow the profits. Well, we know how to do that. We make more money, we do more sales, uh, reduce our costs, make more profit but the multiple can actually help us as well. And that multiple really comes back to our six steps. How strong are our foundations? How good is our niche? Okay, that, that drives our profit. It also creates the consistency of our income. So if I've got a really good niche that's gonna be here for 10 years, then I'm likely to be making money into the long term. My systems and processes, so is everything systemized? You know, does it not rely on any one person? Have I got a great team in place? So if I've got a great team, that's going to increase the multiplier. And the synergy, is it all working perfectly together or are, are all the departments fighting against each other? And ultimately, diversification results, acquisitions, can I add more businesses to it? OK, so these are all the factors that will increase a, a business valuation. So when we're when we're growing a business, we're not only thinking of profit. I've got to drive more profit, but I'm also thinking, how do I enjoy, ensure the, the consistency of that profit into the future? And that's why we need to invest in computer systems, you know, written systems. We've got to have brands. We've got to have, you know, clearly identified niches we've got to have a really strong database all of these things that may not be increasing profit but they're increasing the multiplication factor okay because they, they assure the company's ability to make profit into the future any 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 questions on that I know, I know for Olivia and Megan, this, this might be a little bit sort of high level, but I think it's important for everyone to understand the game of the business. So the game is, you know, to give the shareholders a return on their investment, to increase shareholder value. And by doing that is through profit and the strength of the business within it as well. So, Jan, any, any questions from you? No, it just links in with everything that we've been through already and just, you know, it's just kind of hammering the point home for me, which is really good. So going back to what gets measured gets improved. So if, if we've got this mindset that I want to know the numbers because that's a reflection of my growth and I want the numbers to be going in the right way. So that gives me the motivation to, to do more. 
The first thing is we've got these sort of financial measures. So what are our, our key financial measures? Well, the first thing within a business is you've got to reconcile your bank on a, on a very regular basis. Now, the beauty with account systems is they do this all the time. Okay. Um, I think I've got, so I think I'm, let me just check. I think I do all of these. Uh, so, so these are my top seven re reconciliations, cash flows, age debtors, credit. So I'm going to run through each of these individually as, as we go through now. So reconciliations are really the starting point. Okay. As I said, I think most people now are using Xero or QuickBooks, you know, a system where it will pull down your bank statement from the cloud, all of your payments and receipts. Yeah, you know, uh, put on there, and then it reconciles is one to the other. <clears throat> so it's really important to do this on a regular basis. Okay, so at least once a week, so that the figures that you're looking at are always current, always up to date, because all most of your transactions go through your bank. Now, if you run credit cards, if you run PayPal accounts, anything like that that is non sort of traditional bank account. Again, make sure they're all set up. Make sure you're reconciling those. Yeah, every if not every day, every week. Okay, it's a, it's a must because when you look at numbers, you've got to be looking at the real time figures as you go. So, the second thing then is to make sure that you understand your cash flow. So, cash in, cash out, because cash is king. Cash is the lifeblood of your business. So. So having some form of cash flow forecast is really key. How much money is going to be coming in each week for the next four weeks, next 13 weeks? What's my outflow? Now, if your outflow is consistent, so you're, you know, on average, you know, my outgoings are £5,000 a month, yeah, then you can pretty much just put that in as a, a set, set line and then you can uh, just bring in the income on top of that. So you're just really trying to predict the income flow. So Olivia, if you're chasing money all the time, you want to know, right, what's my, my income coming in on a regular basis? And therefore, if I'm not achieving that, then you know there's a problem. Like there's, right, I need to chase some debts. Yeah, I've got behind. Your yeah, invoicing isn't up to date. Something is causing that income not to be as I, ex I expected it. OK, so a cash flow is really just a, a way of predicting what your bank balance is going to be at the end of each period. <clears throat> Whether you do it weekly or monthly really depends on your income and your outflow regularity. So if, if you generally pay payments once a month, then you can probably do a monthly cash flow. If your payments go out every single week, then do a weekly cash flow. If you've got daily payments coming in and going out, then you do a daily cash flow. OK, so but. It, it's more important when cash is tight, OK, when you're when you're sort of bouncing around your overdraft limit or, you know, uh, you're worried about your cash. But I, I would really get into the habit of even if you've got loads of money in the bank, still do a cash flow. OK, because. You know, it's, it's amazing how when you've got a bit of money and you're doing well, how lax you can be, how suddenly the debtors go up, how stock levels go up, you know, and and that's when things turn again. That's what will, will really hurt you because you're not on top of it and it'll take you two, three months to catch up. So, so if you want to generate more cash, yeah, then the, the top cash flow strategies are. Just sell more stuff, you know, increase your prices, collect more money from your debtors. Yeah, clear out old stock because, you know, stock is just money sitting there doing nothing. Are there any unused assets? So do you have vans that are sitting there, you know, pieces of equipment that you're not using? Now, what, what happens with a lot of people with assets is uh, you'll you're relate to this, Dave. So let, let's say I bought a, a van for £10,000. Okay, the day after I've bought it, how much is my van worth? About 8000 About 8000 okay. In a year's time, it's probably worth 5000 
But on your books and in your mind, how much is the van worth? Still 10,000 as it's getting reduced. Okay, so if I said to you, you're not using that van, yet you need to sell it, and you can only get 5,000 for it, what's, what's your emotion telling you? Well, probably to keep it, just on my books is 10. Keep it on the books at 10, because at 10, it's making my figures look good. Mm -hmm. If I sell it for five, I'm going to have to realise a five grand loss, aren't I? Yeah. So that van sits there on your forecourt for the next two years, collecting dust. Yeah, so, so that £5,000 is just sat there doing nothing. If you'd sold that and got £5,000 and bought £5,000 of stock and sold it for twice what you paid for it, you'd make that £5,000 back in, what, three months? Yeah. And, th and this is what holds a lot of people back, is, is they have an emotion about the asset, oh, it's worth 10000 yeah? No, it's only worth what it can generate. If you've got an asset that's not making you money, it's not an asset. So every single thing that you, you own, yeah, is it being used? Is it making me money? If it's not, then I don't care you know, what, it, what it costs you, because what it costs you is what we call a sunk cost. It's gone. It's history. Yeah. Can you, could you sell it? And with that money, could you make more money from it? If my van is out running around, you know, taking the guys fixing jobs, it's earning me money. If my computer is being used, it's earning me money. If it's not being used, then it's not earning me money. Therefore, it's not an asset. OK, so we've got to start looking to, to reduce as non-earning assets. Get rid of them. Even, even you know, I've had clients that have had computers, you know, that actually have no value. They can't sell them. But they put them in a, a cupboard. Yeah, and that cupboard ends up being a bigger cupboard and then they end up having to move offices because they've run out of space to put their people because their cupboards and their, their offices are full of you know, equipment they haven't scrapped. It's crazy. Yeah, so, so really sort of, you know, think, look around and, and just question, you know, if it's sitting there, is it earning me money? Is it actually doing something to improve the profit of this business if it's not then get rid of it so so obviously you know if we can reduce cost of sales reduce overheads and potentially and I, the reason i put it at the bottom is it should always be the last resort okay it's the last resort if we want cash in our business is to borrow now what most people do is they go straight to here and they go i've run out of money therefore i'll just borrow some more so if we haven't fixed all of these, let's say I borrow, you know, let's say I borrow a hundred thousand, and I'm burning ten thousand pounds a month. How how much does that hundred thousand pound buy me? Ten months. Ten months. Okay. If I do nothing about this lot, and I continue to burn that money, I'm going to run out of money again. Yeah, if that 100,000 buys me 10 months to fix this lot, then I would say, okay, that's fine. That's, that's an okay borrowing. If I'm not going to use that money to actually make me money, then that's what we call bad debt. Good debt is borrowing money to make money. Bad debt is borrowing money to fill a hole. So would you say, then, Kevin, if you, would, if you said you... If you went to larger premises and employed, you know, twice as many staff and bought twice as many vans and you said, right, I need a, a 20 grand cash injection to do that, that would be good borrowing. Yes. Providing your cost model today is working. Yeah. As, as long as your numbers say, if I doubled all of that, I would make double the amount of profit. Yeah. Then yes. Then you, it's a good thing to go and borrow that money to double up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so when you do borrow, you know, the, bank, the banks will ask you for a business plan, okay? But, but business plans for banks are easy, easy to produce. Yeah, 
what what you've got to have is the confidence and the knowledge that by doing this it's it's an investment i'm going to invest this money and i'm going to make more money from it yeah if you if you if any time and, and guys this is in a personal world as well you know if you were to borrow who's um olivia megan have you bought houses recently or you currently trying buy a house? to <laughs> you're trying to okay so so it's an interesting one. A house is a good one. You know, is, is borrowing them on a mortgage, is that good debt or bad debt? I guess it's good. I don't know. Well, I suppose you're, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so it, I guess it's good. So why would it be good debt on the basis of what I've said? Well, because you... Oh, I don't know, but I think that maybe because your property price could increase. Exactly. Okay, that that is really the only reason why you take a mortgage on a house, because the you're 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 gambling, and it is a gamble, but you're gambling based on past knowledge, and gambling with past knowledge is fine. That house prices are going to go up. So therefore, if I buy a house for, let's say, I, how, what's, how much is the house you want to buy? 250. 250,000. How much are you allowed to, do you want to borrow? We are borrowing 200. You're borrowing 200. So you're putting 50,000 of your own money into this house. Yes. Okay. In 20 years time, how much is your mortgage? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> On the, basis you, on the basis you take out a 20 year mortgage. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. oh, that's fast maths. I I'm really sorry. My brain is dead. So, 20, so your, your mortgage will be zero. <laughs> cool. yeah. In 20 years, how much would your house be worth? Well, it's a, you, I don't know. You, you don't, don't know. No. <laughs> so, in a way, you're, you're going into an investment without understanding why you're doing it. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? That's probably a bad thing. It's be a bad thing, certainly if you're into finance. Which <laughs> okay, so so I'm going to say, so Dave, you've, you've got a few properties, haven't you? Sorry, Kevin, is that me? Yeah. So, in, yeah. In, so if, you, if you buy a, a property for 250 in 20 years, what would you hope that value would be? Uh, probably increase to about a million. You're lucky. If you're very lucky, so let, let's just be <laughs> lucky, cautious, Dave. <laughs> let's say it doubles. Double to five hundred. Okay, so it's double to five hundred. So at the moment, you put fifty thousand in yep, to buy a property of two fifty. In twenty years' time, your property is worth five hundred thousand. What's your return on investment? 300. 300 or 250? 250, you get 50 investment back, don't you? So, yeah, you've made 450,000, haven't you? Yeah. So you've got a nine times, times. return yeah. on investment. Is nine times return on investment a good investment, Olivia? Yeah, it is. <laughs> not a bad investment, is it? <laughs> For a little terrace in Salisbury. <laughs> If, if that property didn't move at all, and in 20 years it was still worth 250, then all you've done is basically rented for 20 years. Now, could you rent a better house for the mortgage than you're paying for the mortgage? You probably could, but it wouldn't... Oh, I suppose it's not really yours anyway, because you've got mortgage on it, but... <laughs> Okay, so so th this is this is the, the the key thing. Whenever you invest in something, yeah, you've got to go through this. So personally, but also but in the business, you go through this mindset. If I pay this, is it going to give me a return? Now, it could give me a return in cash, you know. So I might buy a buy to let property, and it gives me a rental income, or it's a it's a capital value increase. Yeah, it's got to be one or the other. It's either increasing capital value or it's a uh, cash out so you've probably heard of people investing in bitcoin at the moment and cryptocurrency stuff like that you know 
that they're investing it because they see that the market's going to go up and they're going to get a return. Okay, so so that investment is, is, is the mindset that we're in here. And that's the mindset we need in our business. If I take on a new person, yeah, is that person going to generate me more income? Is it going to generate me more, more profit? If I buy a computer equipment, is that going to buy, is that going to generate me more profit? If you knew hand on, go back, let's go back to Jan now. If you knew hand on heart that everything that you invested in gave you at least a two to three times return on investment. Yeah. How much money would you have left in the bank account? What if I invested everything I had knowing that I was going to get that return? Yeah. I'd invest everything that I possibly could afford to. So how much would be in your bank account? A lot less than what's in there now. Well, but then I would have a lot more assets. Yeah, but how much would be in your bank account? Less money than what's in there now because I would have invested it. Yeah, so your bank balance would be zero, wouldn't it? Yeah. Because if you had, if you knew without shadow of a doubt, every penny you invested would give you a three times return. Even the money that you made, you'd reinvest. 100% now, I'd be very frugal. I probably would make a lot less purchases so that I had <clears> even more money to invest. Right. So, and this is, this is why running your business, but on your bank account, where we talked about cash flow, you know, this, at this level here, yeah, where we're looking at bank, bank, that's okay to a certain level. But the problem with that is the game that we're playing here, yeah, is make this number as big as possible. As I've just told you that actually, if you know how to invest your money, this number should be as small as possible. And this is what stops a lot of businesses growing is they're so focused on making cash that they forget that there's an investment thing to, to go after as well. And this, this is the real skill within a business is knowing how, how much should be here to protect for protection, yeah? How much should not be in there for growth? If I, if I continually risked all my money on investment strategies, yeah? So, um, so, who, so Olivia, you, you sort of mentioned about cryptocurrency. You know, if I said to you, cryptocurrency is guaranteed to give you a 900 times return on investment, yeah, and your house is only ever going to give you a nine times return on investment, which one would you go for? If I had somewhere to live. <laughs> If you're making a hundred times return on investment, you just go and rent somewhere else. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so as long as I had a roof over my head or a couple box, then it'd be fine. Yeah. But would it would it be wise to put every last penny you have into into something as risky no. as cryptocurrency? No, it wouldn't. Okay, and likewise within a business, you, we've got to understand the risk of, of investing in certain things and the reward that we're going to get from it and this is why numbers are so so important because the only way to analyze risk is numbers you know if, if you if you know any actuaries i don't know if you you know, know anyone that's exciting enough to be in the actuary business uh you know they're they're extremely intelligent people and all they do is calculate risk they have massive great big computers and spreadsheets that calculate the risk of certain events happening and the premium you know, for your insurance or your premium for your pension, what it should be. Okay, so, so really getting to, to love and understand numbers in, an, in a sort of non-emotional way, or certainly a negative emotional way, is fundamental to business. If you don't know them, if you, if you fear them, if you get an, a negative emotion around them, then you're going to struggle. So you've, the more you use them, the more you question, the, the better you're going to become at it. So our age debtors and creditors, you know, the things that we've got to understand with this is who owes what. So we've got to do a, uh, a uh, an age debt report. So I've got an age debt report here. So this, this is a typical age debt report. So every 
at least every month, if not more often, you, to, you, you get this off your system and you work out, you know, what is overdue, you know, what's in my 30 days and what's 90 days plus. So, you know, this one here should be paid. I need to chase this. Okay. And if you want to have something that you can compare period to period, we have a thing called debtor days, which is the debts at the end of the month divided by the sales for the year times 365. Okay. So this would say on average with 30 days or 60 days. Now, if I give credit of 30 days and my debtor days are 90, what does that suggest? Sixty days of you've lent the money. Yeah, you're you're lending them your money for sixty days. Now, if you were to borrow money from a bank for sixty days, unsecured because there's no security on this, how much would the bank charge you? Yeah, it'd probably be on at least what eight percent. Seven percent. Yeah, I mean, generally, they, uh, the first thing is they probably wouldn't lend to you. But if you, so, let's wait. Let's say you went to a pay. Have you? Has anybody used a payday loan? <laughs> yeah, similar to. Yeah. So, how, how much did a payday loan type business charge you? Oh, I think it was something like about five point seven percent, which I thought was quite good. That I found out it was done weekly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 5% per week, so about 600% a year. Yeah. Okay, so, so that unsecured short-term borrowing has ridiculous interest rates. So you're lending this money to your clients for what? For nothing. Yeah. Okay, so I would always recommend in your terms and conditions, put a clause in there that says, you know, any, any overdue uh, payments will be charged at 5% per month. Yeah, that's what we've got on the bottom of all our invoices. Late payments are subject to a 5%. Yeah, but is it 5% per month, Dave? Oh, do you know what? I don't know that. I bet, you, I bet you it's not. I bet you it's 5% for the, or 5% above base or something. Let's have a look. Outstanding. Thank you. Yeah, it says late payments may incur five percent surcharge above base rate. Yeah. What what's base rate at the moment? 0 0.2, is it? 0 0.2. So you're charging how much? 5.2. 5.2. Yeah, where 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 could you get short-term borrowing for 5.2 percent? Nowhere. And I, I very rarely enforce it, Kevin. It's just if someone doesn't pay after like 60 days, I go. Well, your 100 quid's turned into 105 and it's going up. Yeah, but it hasn't turned into 105, has it? No. Because you'd, I'd have to have borrowed that from you for a whole year before it's 105. Yeah. And this is this is the problem that, you know, you're, we're putting these clauses in our contracts that, you know, it's like hitting somebody with a feather. Mm -hmm. If you don't pay up, I'm going to hit you with a feather. Oh, fuck. You know, there's no incentive there. So we need to make it so it's... Yeah, you know, it, it's actually hurts. You know, if you don't yeah. pay, that's fine. I'll lend you your my money, but it's five, you know, ten percent per month. Yeah. And and you will you, you will get clients that will squinny about it. Oh, you, know, yeah. you can't charge so what but you're not gonna pay me late, are you? Yeah. If you're gonna pay me late, tell me now and I'll put my prices up. Yeah. Or I'll take security or you know, but you're not gonna pay so they've got nowhere to go. Now, again, you don't have to charge them, but I tell you what, the, the best thing you can do with somebody that can pay, who doesn't pay, is send them an invoice for that month's interest. It's amazing how quickly they'll be on the phone to you. So you can't do this. Oh, well, great. Well, pay up and I'll waive the interest. Yeah. 
the big thing with debts is who shouts loudest and makes it uh, as uncomfortable for that person as possible gets paid first. Yeah, the, re the reason that, you know, if, if you're in, you know, and we've all, you know, generally, if you're in business, you've been there where times are tough and you've run out of money. You know, there'll always be something you pay. And it'll be the most, either the most important or the most painful if you don't pay it. So you just got to make sure that, you know, you are at the high level pain point when you do these things. And after all, you know, a job's not a job until it's been paid for. You know, so, so, you know, really understand who owes what, how long it's been understanding, avoid bad debts by chasing, you know, getting on, you know, bad debts become bad debts because you haven't chased them. I mean, sometimes businesses go bust for, for all sorts of reasons. There are some things you just can't avoid, but the majority of bad debts are because we've let people get away with it. And I guarantee you it'll always be, the friends, the family, the person that's a nice person. Okay, there's no nice, pe nice people when it comes to business. You know, people are just people, you know, and it's not personal. It's just, look, you know, show me the money. So, okay, so if you give one extra month's credit, if you have an overdraft, you know, um, it's going to cost you £600 a month for every 100000 you lend. So you've got to look at the cost to you of actually lending that money out and do whatever you can to reduce it. Okay, same as stock. If stock isn't turning over, then you've got to do something to actually turn that stock over and make it make money for you. So I'll, I'll come back to it when I go to the, through the balance sheet. Any question on, on debtors? And cash flow that all clear good so that those those before we even look at the profit and loss cash flow and debtors to me are probably the most important because that's you you can influence that straight away and put cash in in your back pocket by doing those things once we look at the the profit and loss account in essence, all the profit and loss account are is a, is a detailed summary of these five things. Okay, so and and that if you go back to that organisation chart, sales is sales and marketing, cost of sales is operations, overheads is finance. Okay, so that there's actually only four num three numbers, sorry three numbers that are actually on the profit and loss account. The rest of it is just breaking that down into more detail. So, so this is our income, this is money in, and this is money out. So in, out. And obviously, the bigger the difference between in and out means we make a bigger profit. So a profit and loss account is, is just a summary of the transactions over a period of time. Now, the period of time could be a day, a day, a week, a month, a quarter, a year. Okay, but go back to our horse riding example. Yeah, if we play the game over a year and we don't know our score until the end of the year, it's not that much of a compelling game. And I can't improve because I don't know my score until next year. Ideally, you know, within business, it should be weekly and monthly. Monthly is your sort of your check, but I still think there should be a weekly game going on as well. Okay, and I'll, I'll come into more of that when we come into KPIs. But profit loss wise, it should be. My view is is monthly. Some businesses that are more seasonal can potentially go quarterly, but for for the majority of people, it should be monthly. So if I break this down into, into more detail then and, and look what a, a normal profit and loss account looks like, this should be the high level. Okay, so as the managing director of the business or a senior director, I only want to see these figures okay, at this level. I don't want the detail of how much we've spent on postage. It's irrelevant to me because who's responsible for how much we spend on postage?
Who's responsible for overheads of the business? Finance director. Finance director. So that's the finance director's issue. I, I don't want to worry myself about what we spend on postage. I've got to trust my finance director that they are looking at it. Now, if you're also wearing the finance director's hat, then yes, you need to go down into that level of, of detail. But from a business owner, from a you know, from a business owner managing director level, I'm only really interested down at this level. Okay, now if this number here is not the number I want, then I need to go down into more detail. Okay, so let, let's say in January, I was expecting £20,000 of profit. That, that was my target. I achieved it in Feb, but <clears throat> okay. Where would the first place I would need to look at? Where, where, would, you sort of, where would you generally go straight to? Sales. Sales. Okay, so did I hit my sales target? So I'd want to go down to my next level and say, right, my sales, yeah, are, what are they? How, how was that 250 made up? Was there a particular product that I sold that I didn't sell as many of units as I should have done? So for some businesses, this A to C will be A to Z. For some businesses, it might just be A. Some businesses, it might be A, B, C. But the more you can break your income down into its component parts allows you that visibility of why, what do I sell? How much of it do I sell? If you stick it all into one place, it's very difficult to start making decisions from this. Okay, so on this basis, I look at this and say, right, well, actually, my sales figure is okay. It's in line with what I expected it to be. So it's not a sales issue, my profit. Where, where would the next le level I would look into? We go back here. So it would be the cost of sales. So you sales. Like costs and. Yep. Directly about. Okay. It's always the biggest number on, on the profit and loss. Because if a big number is 10% out, that's a big number. If a small number is 10% out, it's irrelevant. And I'm, I'm looking here, I've got a £10,000, at least a £10,000 problem. So I, I've got to look at numbers that, if, if they're wrong, are going to be wrong by about £10,000. There's no point in me going down into petty into postage that we spend 20 quid a, a week on. It might be 100% out, but it's irrelevant on what I'm trying to look at. So, so I would go next into my gross profit and my cost of sales. So here we can start to see now that, ah, hang on a minute. If this was my expectation, my direct costs are now slightly drift. So why is that? So is my raw materials? Well, that's all in line. Yeah. Is my packing? That's all. In, ah, look, carriage, £52,000 of carriage. That's, that's more than it should be. Why is that? And then I'd want to go into granularity down into carriage costs and see what it was. It might have been a one-off expenditure. It might be you know, an invoice that has been posted twice. Okay, so I'm always inquisitive and the big thing for a profit and loss account is whenever you look at it the first thing you ask is why why is the turnover like that why are the costs like that why 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 so i used to be the finance director of a, a pretty big company i had a managing director who was uh, i didn't really i mean he wasn't a great person i didn't respect him but the one thing i did respect him for is i'd, I'd produce a set of figures like this and every time he would go, well, what's that? Why, 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 why is that number 52? I'd, because I was a good FD, I would always have an answer for him. The reason it's that is because this, this, and this, and I'd have a schedule. In the end, I'd preempt it. I'd say, look, I know you're going to ask about carriage. Here's the breakdown of it, and this is why. And I, I did, I did sort of speak to him. I said, what, you know, how is it that you always seem to know which number to look at. He said, the truth is, I don't, I guess. 
just look at that. If anything stands out, I ask you why that number's that. He said, but I'm not looking for the answer. That, the exact answer, I'm not that bothered. I'm, I'm, what I'm interested in is, do you know? How much attention have you, as you, as a finance director, pay to these numbers? And it's your confidence in answering me that I'm looking for. Because if I know I could pick a number and you can give me the answer, then I've got confidence that the rest of the numbers are correct. If you sit there and go, oh, 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 I don't know, I don't know, or then I start worrying about everything else. Because I'm running this business based on the information you're giving me. Yeah. And if you're not sure what this number means, then I'm not sure. And then we've got problems. If you're 100% sure, then I've got the confidence that what you're showing me is right. So your job, you know, as managing directors, but even Megan, Olivia, in your role is to question. Don't just produce numbers and say, well, there's the numbers. You should have gone through every single number and go, does that look right? Is that the right number? Yeah. If I was in Nick's shoes or if I was in my dad's shoes, what question would I be asking? And your job is to preempt all the any question that could come out. And it's difficult when, when you're the producer of numbers, you're so desperate to produce them. And then you go, oh, right, there it is. And then you present them. And the first thing somebody comes down and goes, hey, mate, what's that? And you go, oh, shit you've got to go back and change it now for me the confidence i then have in every other number on that page has just gone out the window i don't trust that number i don't trust that number i don't trust that number your job if you're into finance is to give the people reading it confidence that they may be bad they may be you know these numbers might be horrendous you know, this might be minus eighty thousand. yeah think that, that is it is it's you you have no control over that you're just reporting but what you've got to purvey is the confidence that that number is the right number and if you're not sure you've got to bring it up and say look we've got these numbers but i really am not sure about this this is why and and therefore more work is needed and, See, i'm not convinced on mine kevin really but how do i change it because obviously it's a bit the software is zero yeah and I don't seem to have any salaries in my. I've and you asked. Blank... Can I share my screen? I blanked out my numbers. Yeah. Just to show the categories that I've got. What? Do it now. Yeah, just yeah, it was just to say, you've got a lot more lines on yours than I've got. When I hit profit and loss on zero. Yeah. This is the categories I get, but the numbers never match up. Right. Then, then we've got a problem. Mm -hmm. then, then we need to look at it and find out why it's not as it should be. Now, is that my job or my accountant's job? It's your, your job to ask the question. Mm -hmm. It's your accountant's job to fix it. Yeah. Now, most accountants won't fix it unless you ask them. This is, this is what frustrates me with accountants is, is they're reactive. If you, oh, if you wanted it like that, I'll do it like that. Well, how do I know what I want unless I know what I want? Yeah. And so this is why I'm showing you this is, is for me, yeah, I've spent years and years. This is, I mean, I'd say this is the minimum. Yeah. Okay. So this level is, you know, you, you want to be able to see this. Okay. And you can do this in zero. Yeah. But you want to be able to get, because, because you're not just the MD, you're also, the sales director, the fine, you, know, you want to be able to see the granularity. So yeah, as, as an operations director, this to me is really important. Mm -hmm. As a sales and marketing director, I actually want more detail above here because I want to know what leads, you know, what my leads are, what my conversion rate is. So I'd need another set of numbers in addition to that. Okay, so it's your, your job because at the end of the day, these are your numbers you have to ask the accountant, the bookkeeper, the question, because don't, please do not rely on them coming to you and telling you this is how it should be done. Right. Yeah, you've got to say, I want my accounts in this format, you know, and I'm quite happy to send you this format and, and you can send it. So I want it in this format, make it happen. But you shouldn't be the one that does it unless you really are fed up with them and they're not doing it. 
but then I'd say change your counters. Yeah. Because there's a reason why they certain things are switched on and switched off from the profit and loss, but I don't for straight away I've got no salaries on there. Well, then then there's something either either the report is wrong or they're not posting them yeah you know, in enough time. Yeah. I mean if, if I'd say I think I've got access to your zero, so I'll uh, if you remind me, I'll, I'll I'll go through it with you and we can pull it apart. Yeah, that's cool. Cheers, Kevin. Okay. So, so that's sales, cost of sales. Then as the, where my finance director's hat, I now want to go down into overhead. So I'm now looking in the overheads and seeing, you know, are they in line? You know, what's, what's good? What's bad? What's my trend? You know, question every single line. Yeah, am I, oops. Sorry. Am, am I actually, you know, are we spending too much for rent and rates? You know, when was the last time we reviewed our electricity contracts? You know, when was the last time we got another quote for our insurance? Now, are we spending too much here, here, here? So I'm questioning every single line on a regular basis. I've just been working with a, a finance director for one of my clients and I've, you know, he's got to a point now, he's only been with the company a few months. Um, but it's it's saying, right, now your job is to come come to me or come to us and say, right, I've looked through the overhead. I think I can make a 10% saving yet in these three areas. Because as a finance director, that's your job. Your job is to ensure the overheads are relevant to the size of the operation that we're running. If they're too too light, means we're not, you know, we're not spending enough. If they're too heavy, we're spending too much. And that always, you know, it's not something you look at daily, but certainly once a month, once a quarter, you should be analyzing. So maybe you know, rent is up, you know, in April, right? April's job, or probably March's job, is to, is to do some rent negotiations. My insurance contract is up in August. In July, I should be doing insurance negotiations. Otherwise, what happens is you get in a habit of just spending what you've always spent and you're just wasting money there. Okay. So once we've got our, our sort of zero accounts looking like this, what we'd want to then do is actually you know, create a budget and actually start forecasting what we're actually going to be doing. So, so this, in effect, is a budget of, of actually setting targets for each of these costs and our target for our sales yeah, so that we can then compare our actual progress towards. So what we'll end up with is something like this that says, right, this is what we did this month. Okay, this is our this month. I'm comparing that now to a budget because number in isolation means nothing. Yeah, every number you must compare it to something else. Otherwise, it's it's meaningless. So I'm comparing it to where I said I was going to be yeah, and where I was last year. So in this case, yeah, I'm I'm ahead of la ahead of budget and I'm ahead of last year. So I'm, I'm moving in the right direction. We bring in percentages because sometimes numbers comparing this number to this number, you know, while it looks good, that actually you know, this gross profit percentage isn't necessarily as good. So percentages allow us to compare sometimes easier and better you know, numbers that are slightly different. And then we look at month in isolation, but also our cumulative position to date, because obviously the game of business is profit over the course of 12 months. So we want to look at the monthly game, but also the, the yearly game as well. Kevin, can I just ask a question? Mm, I don't please. think it might be me being a bit dipsy here, but if we're looking at the January in the actual, the actual mm. is 26,300, yeah. Why does it show as the budget in the cumulative column, in the cumulative side? And why does the budget of 21,140 show as the actual on the, the cumulative side? That is a very good question. And that is purely because I have 
made the figures up. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> so okay. But, well, but so that, it should have been the other way around. It should I think it should be the other way around, but I'm looking at the uh some of the other figures and that they don't add up either. So Right, okay. Uh, so, you, just but, in, you just put that in the test us. I put that into test you because what did I, I say to you? It's all about the detail. It's about but when you review a set of questions, what should you be saying? Um uh, comparing it to historical. Why? 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 Why 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 is the why? Yeah, don't don't take anything in a set of accounts as, as being correct. Okay. And also Christmas. one more thing. So this this mm. budget the actual is obviously really good, would be very useful. Yeah. Is this something that you should expect your accountant to do for you if you ask? If you ask, they will do it. The expectation is the majority have got no idea, certainly to get it to this level. I mean, they, they can set it. I mean, the beauty with zero is you can actually set zero up to do this for you. So if I provide, if I put my budget together, which I'm working on, as you know, yep. and I provide that to Jim, he should be able to key those figures into zero and basically press button at the end of the month and give me this. Yeah. Yeah, right, okay. You should be able to say to him, say, set, please set me up a report in zero that shows me this. It, it, it will take a bit of time and you will have to pay for it because it will take time. But the beauty with zero, is once it's set up, it's done. Whereas you know, in the old days, I mean, you can see from this, this is a spreadsheet. You know, in the old days, I had to pull data out of, of the account system, put it into a spreadsheet, make sure all the figures added up, make sure nothing was missed. Yeah, and, and that would take me you know, probably two days every month to do. If you get zero working, it's just push a button, there it is. Okay, thank you. But, you know, what... The big thing, certainly if you're not a financial expert or you feel that you're not a financial expert, is never let that stop you ask the question why. There are no stupid, even if you, even if I'd said, oh, that's because of that, and you went, oh, yeah, of course it is. Mm -hmm. Don't ever let that put you off asking that, the stupid question because the day you stop asking the question you want to ask is the day you miss something big time. Okay. okay. I, I had a client, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you in, in a minute on on the balance sheet. But I had a client that their managed their accountant, and this was somebody that employed and worked with them for a number of years, was producing figures like this: profit, 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 profit. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. They were only looking at here. And one day they got a knock at the door of the bailiffs uh, from the VAT. Said we've come to collect eighty thousand pounds of uh, unpaid VAT money. And they said, well, we're up to date with our VAT. I said, not according to our records. And the accountant then didn't turn up to work the next day, disappeared. And when we looked into it, he'd been forging the figures for the past 12 months. Okay, the figures that the accountant, who was a trusted member of the team, was producing were all wrong. And the reason that they were wrong is because the real figures were showing a loss, he didn't want to upset the directors. Wow. Okay, so, so you know, th these are really hard lessons to learn that you'd never abdicate your numbers. You, are, you get them, you ask them. If, if, they, if they look odd, yeah, then they generally are odd. You, you, you should know your business enough to know that what you're expecting. And always ask the why question. Not, and it's not about emotion. It's why are they that, and what do I need to do to make them better? So, so that brings us then onto the balance sheet. So, and this is this is the one statement, as I sort of said to you before, that is the one that most people ignore. Most people do understand their profit and loss. They can see, you know, income, expenditure, profit. They understand that. But when it comes to the balance sheet. It's the one that they don't print off because they don't really understand. And, and this is the one that will cause you more problems generally than the profit loss account, as, as I just shown you sort of in that example. So while, while the profit and loss is like a movie, yeah, it's a it's a sort of you know, it's a history over a period of time, be it a month, a, a quarter, a year, 
A balance sheet is like a photograph. It's a snapshot. So think, think of your businesses like musical chairs. OK, so the music's playing, everyone's running around and then the music stops and you go, stop. Where's my money? OK, where's my money gone from? Yeah. And where's my money? Where's my money gone and where's my money come from? Because money comes in, money goes out. It's flowing all the time, all the time. The one thing I guarantee is that there is no very little or no money in your back pocket. So you physically don't actually have pound notes in your hat. You might have a bit of petty cash, but all this money that comes in, goes out, is never in one place at one time. It's always moving. So the balance sheet is your one time, you know, once a, at least once a month, you go stop, where is it? Where's my money? And the way the balance sheet works, it goes back to the way double entry bookkeeping works, is everything in in accounts has an in and an out okay so it's called double entry now in the old days you had to do this manually now with computers you don't really see this double entry but the balance sheet is the one place where you can actually see it so we have this concept of debits and credits debits is where the money's gone so it's left and credits is where it's come in so this is all we're doing with a set of accounts is where the money's come from, where it's gone. So if I if I said to you on the profit and loss account, income, money, income, sales, is money coming into the business. Therefore, it's come from our customers. Therefore, income is a credit. Expenses, money that we've spent, money's gone, it's left, is a debit. Okay, so that's nice and simple. Credits are money coming in debits and money going out but on a balance sheet where our money goes is it goes into things like fixed assets land and buildings plant and equipment motor vehicles so these are what we call tangible assets I, I can touch them okay my office you know my office wall here is something i can touch you know my computer is something i can touch these are all tangible assets so the money is gone out of my hand out of my bank account into a piece of equipment. We also go into what we call current assets. So a fixed asset is an asset that lasts more than one year. So if my computer is going to sit on my desk for more than one year, it's a fixed asset. A current asset is an asset that generally doesn't stay in one, one form for more than a year. So stock comes in and it generally goes out and comes in and goes out. It's always moving. Trade debtors, it's never the same debtors that are outstanding for more than one year, hopefully. My bank balance, the cash in my bank, is never there for more than one year. Okay, Any money that I've lent is never there for more than a period of time. So these are what we call current or, or liquid assets. They're always flowing, always moving. So... In a way, these are good things because I've turned cash into assets. But Megan, what's the sole purpose of an asset is to? <clears throat> to make more money from it. Make more money. OK, so are my land and buildings making me more money? Am I getting a return on them? Yeah, is my, is my equipment making me money? Are my vehicles making me money? Is my stock making me money? Is my debtors making me money? These are all things that if they're not making me money, then I'm not using them to the best. OK, so so that's where the money's gone. Where it comes from is it comes from borrowing. So overdrafts, we borrow money from our creditors. So they give us credit terms. We borrow money from HMRC because we're allowed to collect the PAYE, national insurance and VAT before we hand it back to them. We can borrow loans and I'm not going to go into accruals at this stage, but we have something called accruals. We also borrow from our shareholders. So the initial share investment reserves are the reserves that are left in the company. So some of the times they leave money from one year to another in the company. And obviously, the net of the income and expenditure, the profit or loss, 
for that particular period itself. <clears throat> so, so that is really all a balance sheet is, is where's my money come from? Where's my money gone? Now, it's not normally shown in this, in the old days, a balance sheet was shown like this. And to be honest, it would make a lot more sense if it, it was again. It's generally more the fixed assets and current assets sit above. So, so basically we have fixed assets, current assets sits above here. Okay, and then we draw a line here and then we say net assets. Yeah, and that must equal the shareholders funds. So we just draw the line in a slightly different way just because of accounting standards, et cetera. But the essence is where's my money come from? Where's my money gone? And when we look at a balance sheet, we should always, again, compare it. A balance sheet, in a, a photograph in isolation, actually doesn't mean anything. So we should always compare a balance sheet to a previous period. Now, it's either last month or last year, but it's got to be compared to something. I like it in zero. Most of the reports there, you can put balance sheet for the last four months. Because I want to see the trend of, you know, what's the trend of my stock? Is, is my stock going up? Is it going down? What's the trend of my debtors? What's the trend of my bank balance? What's the trend of my overdraft of my trade creditors? Now, what, what happens with most accountants is they'll give you a balance sheet and it will just be this month's figures. It's just crap, absolute crap. I just send it back. I said, no, this, this is, you've given me a pointless piece of information. And that's why most people then ignore the balance sheet because the month's figures in isolation mean nothing. Can I please ask a question? Mm. So I know that, so when I was in recruitment and I worked for, it was like a, a big, UK um, company that I worked for with various different divisions and I remember coming up the year end and it was like it was always this big panic of get you they were going through like a management buyout they were trying to like obviously increase the value um, of, of the business and it was always like this big panic of um, don't put this through and put this through and um, obviously because they were trying to manipulate the figures in some way yeah yeah and as a small business owner um, I'm probably more on top of my finances than I've ever been the past few months. But Kevin, if I'm honest with you, there's been times when I think, oh, don't worry, as long as you, if you pay everyone, if it's like a few days late and it goes over into the next month, don't worry too much, much about it. The same with money that was owed to me. I'm like, totally on top of everything now. But is there some things that you really should and shouldn't do as far as your finances are concerned because I'm aware that obviously these figures are great, but your figures are this this picture, this snapshot or movie which you're going to be shown through the P and L and the balance sheet is only going to be telling the right story and relevant if the figures in my mind are completely current time as possible and up to date. Right. Yeah. So yeah. basically, what what's what's your your opinion on what I've just said? And is there anything <clears throat> that you shouldn't, shouldn't like really be doing your 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 figures should always be 100 percent up to date and correct that's that's number one you know if, if you get a set of figures that are, are something's missing yeah just chuck them back there's no point in looking at them just chuck them back so it's, it's not good enough you know send it to me when you are 100 percent happy that this is correct because otherwise you start making judgments and 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 look when I said don't be emotional about things you will always be emotional I'm saying is control your emotions about it understand that if the numbers are bad you're going to feel bad but then do something positive about it don't don't just let that bad feeling make you ignore it if you if you start looking at figures and, and we have certainly with with companies that you know with you you have a, sometimes a lot of stock. So if you don't get your stock figure right, that will have a big influence on your balance sheet and your profit and loss account. So if you're looking at a figure that has a great profit because you know there's no you haven't put reduced the stock, then you're going to feel great. Oh, we're doing really great, yeah. But then then the account. Oh, I forgot the stock. Suddenly, oh god, now I feel really bad. So you've got to make sure that they are correct. What, what happens 
in bigger businesses and and we call, we have something called creative accounting okay because accounts are there for us to assess the performance of the business but they're also exter you know, external people can sometimes look at them so if you've got to report to the bank you know, or shareholders sometimes you want to be a bit creative with those numbers so what happens is people start to overinflate stock figures yeah they don't invoice certain things and, and they start manipulating the profit and loss account to make it look like something that it's not quite but it will be okay yeah now if you if you understand what that is and and you know and you're in control of it then that's okay but what happens to some unscrupulous people but also lazy people is they start compounding those adjustments so i'll increase stock increase profit because whatever I do to one side, I have to do to the other side. So I increase stock, increase profit this month, next month. Oh, shit, we still haven't made any money. So I'll, a quick fix is I'll increase stock and increase profit. Oh, that's that's sorted that one out. Next month, I'll increase stock, increase profit. By the end of the year, you've got a million pound of fictitious stock. And eventually it will catch up with you. And, and I, I that's why I say you've always got to look at the balance sheet because it Balance sheet is like the carpet in which all the crap gets swept under. Mm -hmm. So we sweep it into the balance sheet. No one will know it there. No one will see it there because no one understands it. No one looks. And then eventually after a year, two years, you know, suddenly you know, the cows come home to roost. That's not mi mixing me metaphors. Uh, and you've, you've got to rebalance it. Okay. So it's, it's a quick fix. It's one that I would urge not to do but there are some times where you have to do it okay but if you do do it then be really aware of why you're doing it and make sure that as quickly as possible next year you 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 switch it back out again okay does that answer your question yes yes it does it does thank you okay and that but that's why you've got to look at profit and loss and balance you can never look at the profit and loss in isolation. You you are just, you know, doomed for failure. So, so a little bit because um, I'm just con I'm conscious that we've run over a little. Bit. Is everybody okay for a little bit longer? Because uh, we've gone into quite a bit of detail, and there's a couple of bits I want to just make sure we cover. So, Dave, you, you were talking about the uh, the costs going up. Um, and we, never, we, we, we seem to get busier, turnover grows, but we never make enough money. So, so this, this is the concept you need to understand with this is we have a baseline of fixed costs. OK, so whether you sell one thing, you know, one pound or nothing or a thousand pounds, your fixed costs are the same. So that really is your overhead. OK, so that stays the same. Let's say it's five hundred thousand. Then have our variable costs, which go up as we sell more. OK, uh, and our variable cost on top of our total cost yeah, is sorry, a variable cost plus our fixed cost. These two together is our total cost. So at this point here, we break even. OK. So that's our, our break even figure there. Down here, we make a loss and up here we make a profit. <clears throat> the problem the problem with this is is fixed costs are only fixed over a period of time fixed costs actually do this okay so i'm just let me just let me just come back here okay. so fixed costs actually do this over a over a longer period of time but our sales does this so down here, at this point here, we make really good profit. But we know in order to get to the next level, we've got to invest in that van or that person or that piece of equipment. And that investment puts us back now into a loss. Not a big loss, but a, a small loss. So what we've got to understand is that jump here has got to get us to a point here where this is bigger than this. So we're making more profit at this level, 
that leads us then at some point we have to then invest in something else yeah, which takes us to the next level and that ultimately you know we want to be up up here where we're making really good profit because the game of the business is profit it's not turnover this isn't the goal this is the goal but we sometimes have to go through this period of making less profit because we've invested to let us get to the next level and then we, we make less profit because that we want to go to the next level. Now, the only way that you can do this is <clears throat> through your budgeting, that you have to budget for it, you have to predict it, and that gives you the confidence to do it. The danger is, is you do really well, not predicting forwards, therefore you invest in that van, suddenly your profit's gone, and you end up you know, doing this with your turnover, and this with your costs, and you're only making this, then you're investing in that thing. So every investment you do, you've got to be looking, right, how much more profit is that going to make me? How much more revenue and therefore profit will that generate? Does that answer your question, Dave? It does. I think I know, well, I'm hoping I know where I am. I'm on that bit where, as I say, you have it's a break even, make make a little bit of loss at the moment. But when everyone's out there and at full steam, it should make a better profit. Yeah, yeah. And and that's what yeah. Sometimes it's a risk. I I, I risk this because I want this. Yeah. But that's those those are the calculated risks that you that you take in business, and you have to take. Otherwise, you end up just you're just doing this. You just plod along. But that was what was in the back of my head because we have got an extra engineer, which has cost me an extra van, and we've got another member of staff in the office. And then you go, I can see where it's gone, but by investing more, you expect to see more, but it will take a little bit of time till it rises again. Yeah. yeah. But that, that comes back to the plan and the confidence in your plan. Yeah. You've got if you've got a plan, you've got confidence in it, then yeah, it's worth doing it. If if you're just doing it because you're reacting, because the guys are whinging that they want a new van, you know, that's that's not a strategy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes, you know, we had yeah, you know, many years ago, we had to invest in a greenhouse, which cost four million quid. Mm -hmm. you know, and suddenly, you know, that puts this up here. Yeah. But by doing that, sales went like that. Mm -hmm. It's a big gamble, but that we, it was a calculated gamble based on the return on that investment. Yeah. And the fact that you know it was only you know five hundred thousand of our money, and it was three point five million of the bank's money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So so that really is financial statements. Okay. That that's all it is. Balance sheet snapshot profit and loss account sort of uh, video sort of uh, play of what's been happening clarity of who owns what the finance director owns the balance sheet yeah sales sales and marketing direct costs operations overheads finance now you've got to understand in your business if you're small okay i'm going to be wearing number of those hats so it's probably still going to be me but as we grow, I want to outsource the responsibility, not abdicate, but delegate to key people. But I, you have to, as the business owner, as the MD, always be re reviewing those numbers. Never, ever let site, let, let site go of those. Then we get into the more detailed factors of key performance indicators. So profit and loss is monthly. It's okay, but for me, it's not the, we're not the game is too quick to score it on a monthly basis. You've got to look down into, into things that are happening on a, on a more regular basis. So if we if we look back here to our, you know, to these key these key roles, we start to see that sales and marketing is really about you know our pipeline. So I've got to have numbers around the funnel, your leads coming in my ability to convert those leads you know, at every single level as it goes through. That's the game I'm playing on a day-to-day, week-by-week basis. What is the game of lead generation and lead conversion? 
So I'd want to see my marketing director with their own big dashboard of all their numbers, my sales director with the, all of their numbers. And this is why you, you're going to need things like CRM systems, you know, and, you know, uh, marketing systems to actually collate that information for you. Okay. And, you know, breaking it down, we want to look at our five ways numbers. So number of leads we get in conversion rate, number of transactions, average transaction value. These are things that customer service should be looking after. So as we start to grow, as we have more time, we can start breaking down each of the big numbers on the profit and loss account into their component parts and look to measure. Okay. Within uh, operations, it's on time, on budget, on specifications. So are we measuring how quickly we get work done? So time recording becomes imperative. So yeah, are we clocking the hours of people working? How many hours go into it? Because that's a cost. That's a yeah, it's a money out of the business. Are we delivering to to specification to the budgets that we set, the pricings that we set? We've got to be looking at these on a, on a day to day, week by week basis. And you're looking at the starting point is always look at your limited resource. Every business has a limited resource. It might be space, might be materials, might be time, machines, and then you want a rate per whatever that is. Okay, so how many units per hour of machine usage? How many units per area of space? Okay, so you're, you're always looking at rates and something per this, so you're comparing two things together. Okay, so beyond the profit and loss account, we're now into dashboards, into individual areas, and we're really taking the concept that sport has done really well by looking at marginal gains. Yeah, if I can make a 10% improvement in 10 areas yeah, that all affect each other, then I'm going to have a massive impact on the business. So we break it down, measure each one, put it back together again, and then we, we have a really good improvement you can't just go out there and say i'm going to increase sales by 10 percent. it doesn't work that way you can say i'm going to i'm going to generate 10 percent more facebook leads or more linkedin leads yeah because i can control that but you can't control sales it's too big a number so you've got to break this down into component parts and improve each one and the one that it sometimes is harder to measure is the people measurements OK, because they're non-financial, mostly. If you've got a non-financial, then what you need to be thinking is create a scoring system. So, so sick leave ab absenteeism, you can probably do as a number. You know, how many days sick, how many days absent. Happiness, well, how do I measure happiness? Create a scoring system so people can score themselves on a scale of one to ten. How happy are you? and just send that out periodically to people and then they can measure and then you, you collate that data and see what the trend is. The trend that generally we're getting happier is the trend that we're actually getting more miserable. Bring it into appraisals. You know, there's ways to measure engagement and also personal growth. So when you come onto the team, one, I'll talk more about you know, what we need to be looking at there. So there's not an area in your business that you can't measure with a bit of time, a bit of effort, you know, and actually a bit of thought. And if you measure it, as we said, what, what gets measured gets improved. Uh, a really good book on this is uh, this book by John Doe. It was our book club book a, a few months ago. So if you, if you want to read it, great. If you want to get the uh, book club video, it's on my YouTube channel um, on there. And you can just, what we did, we did an hour's discussion about what was in it. But that really <clears throat> does go down into that, you know, measuring uh, what we call OKRs, so objective and key results. It's, it's, it's how, you know, uh, great businesses have actually grown. So. so the key for this is to make sure that you've got a clear budget. Get your monthly profit and loss and balance sheets done. If, you, if you're using Xero uh, or QuickBooks, 
get them done in those systems. You know, it's much easier to do that. Look, it takes, it's harder initially, but long term, you'll benefit from it. Think about your limiting beliefs about money, about numbers and work on those and start to set your key performance indicator dashboard. OK, so what what will be it now? You're not going to complete a, a full dashboard. What you want is one or two things on there uh, and then build on it. So to have one one measurement, see how that goes, then add another measurement then add another measurement over three or four years. You'll build a really great dashboard that will help you run your business um, from a beach somewhere. So Good. So apologies for, for running over there, but I think we, we got into a quite a bit of detail because I thought it was relevant for, for you guys and what you said. Any any final questions that, uh, that you've got? Olivia, what's uh, any questions or what was the main thing you got out of today? I think the main thing I got out of it is to, because I just input, currently input invoices and things like that. And I'm doing a bit to like make sure the statements are right and things like that before Nick gets them. But then he's generating profit and loss. So it'd be nice to have, I might have a chat with him about having, doing it not necessarily together, but being able to be there for the process so I can wheedle out things before he see how he sees them. So he, you know, so I can find the answers to the questions without having to go, where did you find that number? <laughs> yeah, if, if I, mean, I always think it's great. Yeah, you know, if you understand the full process, then you're less likely to mis make mistakes in your bit because you know what the end result should be. Whereas if you don't know what the end result is, well, I'll just post it here because I don't know. Yeah. I don't have no idea. So, okay, cool. Good. Dave? Yeah, I'm good. So the profit and loss and all that, I fully understand what you said. I don't think my zero is right at all. Yeah. I think there's something seriously missing because my manual spreadsheets are completely different to what I get on zero. Okay. Well, if, if you've got if you've got it there, we, we'll stay on for 10 minutes after. We'll have a quick look if you want. Mm. Uh, I don't want to do it now because obviously it's recorded, so I don't yeah. want to show the world your figures. So. <laughs> Megan? Yeah, it's good to just actually, um, <clears throat> you know, face finance because I don't think I, I couldn't see any time in the near future of actually learning about this, like within the business. So it's good to just, like, I've never sort of learned anything about this before. So it's really good yeah. to pop an overview and I might need to come to like another one. But. I think, I think hopefully, you know, you'll, you'll see from this that accounts are simple. Yeah. But they're not easy. Yeah. And, and yeah. too many people see them as complicated and I don't really, you know, because a lot of terms in there like depreciation that are just new words. But the essence is, where's the money come from? Where's the money gone? That's that's all they are. Yeah. And it's, 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 it might be worth persuading perhaps Dad to actually look at them more in depth rather than just go, that's the accounts um, job. <laughs> or just, just ask him, Dad, could I, yeah, I've just done the finance course. I'd love to have a look at the numbers. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and and then ask him the questions. Why is that? Why is that? And see what he see what he responds. <laughs> uh, but you know, ignorance is no excuse. More, more businesses go bust because they don't understand their numbers than for any other reason. Yeah. Uh, so if, if, if there's nothing else you take away, is, is don't be scared of them. Learn to love them. Learn to study them. So, mm. Jan. Okay, so from my point of view, um, I've never taken any enjoyment from finance and accounts. I've always felt that it's um, a necessary evil and it's something which gets left to, you know, those horrible things that we should do first thing in the day, Kevin. Yeah. Well, though, they, I'm, I'm not burying my head in the sand. I'm not an ostrich about it, but I hate it so much that, like, I do it last minute when it's got to be done. And um, I think because of that, they haven't worked for me. They haven't been my friend. But actually yeah. now, it's just really um, stressed that actually they can work for me and they can bring so much benefit to the business. Yeah. Um, so it's just, it's been really useful because I feel like it, I've bought into the accounts and the finance side more. Um, so yeah, really good. Thank you. I mean, the key is learn to love them. But again, you know, treat success and failure with equal disdain. 
-hmm. it's, it's, it's not who you are. It's not, you know, all it is is a reflection of past performance. The, the key always is to look forwards. Okay, as a result of what I see, what am I going to do? That, that's the most empowering thing that you, you'll ever get from this. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Good. Well, look, been a pleasure having you all along, guys. And uh, say, uh, it's we brought forward the sales uh, workshop to next Wednesday at four o'clock. Um, so you'll get a double dose um, over the next week. So yeah, please do book on to that one in the normal way. Otherwise, uh, have a super end of the week and uh, we'll see you again soon. Uh, if you, if you want to stay on, we'll, uh, we'll have a quick look at that. Yeah, all right. Bye, everyone. Thank you. See you later. Bye. Bye.